Thank you very much for taking the time to listen to this short presentation. Brave introduction, my name is Mern Reedy and I'm a Senior Associate in Dylan Eustace's Regulatory Investigations Unit. For the next 10 minutes, I am going to give a high level overview of the Central Bank's Administrative Sanctions Procedure, or ASP. So what is the ASP then? Well, the ASP is provided for in Part 3C of the Central Bank Act 1942, and it allows the bank to impose sanctions on firms or individuals for certain regulatory breaches. In terms of who's in scope, it applies to regulated financial service providers and people who are concerned in the management of those firms. In order to sanction a firm or an individual though, the bank needs to have reasonable grounds to suspect that a prescribed contravention is being or has been committed. And as regards an individual, it needs to show that they participated in a breach by the firm. On that point, I think it's worth mentioning that if somebody is involved in the management of a regulated firm and subsequently resigns, they still can be subject to sanction under the ASP if it can be shown that they were involved in a breach by the firm at the time it was committed. So what's a prescribed contravention then? Well, the term is defined very broadly in the Act and it includes a breach of the legislation listed at Schedule 2 to the Act, with a couple of exceptions, as well as any code made, direction given, or condition or requirement imposed under that legislation. And that's not even an exhaustive list, so really the term is defined very broadly. In terms of how the process commences, it starts with the central bank sending out an investigation letter to the firm or individual, where they will say that they have reasonable grounds to suspect that one or more prescribed contraventions have been committed. The letter will set out high level details of the suspected breaches, and the firm or individual will be asked certain questions, including whether the alleged breaches are admitted or denied. The bank will also look for certain other information. In our experience, the investigations are quite intrusive. For example, there will be a lot of back and forth between the central bank and the firm or individual over a period of several months where the central bank is looking for further information. You also might find that certain people will be called for interviews as part of the investigation process. The investigation itself can take quite some time to conclude so they can be quite resource intensive for a firm. That brings me on then as to how the investigation ends. At the end of the investigation, the central bank has a couple of options open to it. It can decide to take no further action. For example, if there is no evidence to substantiate the suspected breach. It could decide to take a supervisory action, such as imposing a condition or requirement on a firm, or it could decide to issue a supervisory warning may decide to use a supervisory warning where it believes there are reasonable grounds to show that a breach has been committed, but it doesn't think it warrants an administrative sanction. So supervisory warnings might be used where the breach is very minor in nature, there's been immediate remedial action and there's been full cooperation. Essentially, a supervisory warning is a written warning which will form part of the firm's compliance record, but there won't be publicity or a fine. Another option opens the bank then is to refer a case to an inquiry. And an inquiry is a formal mechanism used to decide if a prescribed contravention has been committed, and if so, what sanctions should be imposed. In practice, very few cases have been referred to inquiry to date. Reality is that if you get an investigation letter, the most likely outcome is that the case will end in settlement. At or near the end of the investigation, Generally, the central bank will write out to the firm or individual, notifying them of the fact that the central bank does have the power to enter into settlements. If the other party is interested, a settlement meeting will then be scheduled. If at the meeting a settlement agreement is reached, a binding settlement agreement will be signed by both parties, setting out the settlement terms. As I mentioned, most cases tend to settle, and that's because the bank usually offers a settlement discount to encourage parties to settle. Under the early settlement discount scheme, a discount of up to 30% to the sanctions which the bank believes otherwise would be applied if the case were referred to inquiry can be given. One of the settlement terms which the bank will always insist on is that a public statement is issued afterwards. That will be put on the central bank's website. It will name the parties involved and the fine and it will also give a background to the case. Understandably, that um, causes a lot of concern for firms and individuals, as it can have a big reputational impact. And for that reason, 
it's often subject to a lot of negotiation at a settlement meeting. In terms of sanctions then, the potential sanctions which can be imposed at an inquiry are set out in section 33AQ of the Act. Now obviously if a firm or individual agrees to settle a matter with the central bank, they can agree to settle on any terms. However, the bank tends to use sanctions which are available to an inquiry as a benchmark. The sanctions which can be imposed on firms include fines up to 10 million euro or 10% turnover, whichever is greater. A firm can also have its authorization suspended for a period of up to 12 months or even revoked. For individuals then, they can be fined up to 1 million euro and or be disqualified from being concerned in the management of a regulated entity for a certain period. In terms of inquiries then, the individual or firm can also be required to pay the central bank's costs of the inquiry and the preceding investigation. Somewhat controversially, the legislation doesn't actually provide for the firm or individual to seek to recoup their costs from the central bank, even if no finding is made against them. That's something which has been commented on by the Law Reform Commission, and they recommended that this should be changed. Two other things to note there about the inquiry before I move on. Firstly, the um, certain sectoral pieces of legislation will sometimes provide that different sanctions apply to those set out in Section 33 AQ of the Act. And secondly, the sanctions I've just mentioned are those which apply for breaches which occur on or after the 1st of August 2013. Essentially, the Central Bank Supervision and Enforcement Act 2013 changed some of the sanctions which could be imposed at inquiry, including doubling the maximum monetary penalty which could be imposed on firms or individuals. The largest fine which has been imposed to date on a regulated entity is a fine of 20 million, 21 million euro, which was imposed on a bank last May as a result of certain issues which were uncovered as part of the bank's tracker mortgage investigation. So how does the bank come up with a sanction then? Well, there's two documents published on the central bank's website. These are the outline of the administrative sanctions procedure and also the ASP sanctions guidance, which was published last November. The outline lists certain sanctioning factors which the bank will take into account, and these are grouped under four main headings, which are the nature, seriousness and impact of the breach, the conduct of the regulated entity after the breach, the entity's previous record and other general considerations. You'll see in the slide I have listed certain things which the central bank says it will take into account under each of those main headings, and they include whether the breach was deliberate or reckless, how quickly it was brought to the bank's attention and any remedial action taken, as well as whether there was any loss to consumers. The ASP sanctions guidance then gives further examples of matters which will be considered to be aggravating, mitigating or neutral for each of the sanctioning factors set out in the outline. If somebody is subject to an investigation under the ASP, I would strongly recommend that they do take a look at the outline and also the ASP sanctions guidance. So this slide just looks at some of the settlement statistics to date. As you can see, there have been 134 settlements entered into with firms and individuals, and fines of over 103 million have been imposed. There have been 13 disqualifications and six revocations. Eight cases have also been referred to inquiry, and three of those cases have subsequently settled. So that brings me to the end of this short presentation, and I'd like to thank you again for taking the time to listen. If you do have any queries about the administrative sanctions procedure, please don't hesitate to give me a call or to get in touch with any other member of the regulatory investigations team. Thank you very much.